uh, fitting that we celebrate the canonical establishment of St. Barnabas Parish as we celebrate the liturgical memorial of our Feast of Title. Today's celebration in many ways is the culmination of a journey that this parish community began five years ago. It was July of 2013 that Father Scheibelhofer and many of you entered into full communion with the Catholic Church. And in these, these years that have passed, in that fullness of communion, we have grown and developed our structures of parish life so that the Church could, in this, this canonical act, recognize something much deeper, recognize the great grace of God that has been at work in the hearts of the faithful parishioners here, adding to the vitality of the Church and building up Christ's Church for future generations. That is ultimately what we're celebrating, recognizing how God has been at work in this parish, in this community, and throughout our mission diocese. It is a day of great joy, therefore, and rejoicing, not only for you, the parishioners of St. Barnabas, for Father Jason Catania, who will be formally installed as pastor today, but indeed for the whole ordinary of the chair of St. Peter. Forty-five parish communities throughout the United States and Canada, and today St. Barnabas becomes the 11th of those 45 communities to be formally established as a canonical parish. Because all of our communities who have come into the fullness of Catholic communion have had to work to establish their life, to give witness to the holiness of God and our worship of God and the beauty of that holiness, to the firm foundation of Catholic faith, and the fullness of truth that we have found in union with the Sea of Peter, and to bring our diversity of the way that we express that one Catholic faith to, to bring to bear into the Church so that, that the faith continues to resound as it is taken up and amplified in a multiplicity of voices. This is the great symphony of communion. It is the way that each of us take up the faith and live it in our own lives, individually and today as we celebrate corporately as a parish. It is good, therefore, to celebrate that communion. It's important that at today's Mass, the deacon is the deacon of the Archdiocese of Omaha, ministers at St. Peter. And the acolyte who's taking the subdiaconal ministry today is from Incarnation Parish, another parish of the Ordinary of the Chair of St. Peter in Orlando, Florida, showing in a very visible way that the fullness of the Church's communion is represented here liturgically and sacramentally. It is a day of great joy. And it's also the feast of our patron, St. Barnabas, who is an interesting figure. He was chosen by the Church and given to St. Paul to help him, well, frankly, not scare everybody away. <laughs> They knew about St. Paul only that he who once persecuted the church was now preaching the gospel. This is a matter of rejoicing, but also of some timidity. Is he serious? Has that conversion been real or complete? Or is this perhaps some trick in order to expose who the Christians were and subject them to the violence of the authorities? They weren't entirely sure about this guy. His passion, his zeal, terrified them. And so Paul was sent by the apostles with Barnabas. And it was Barnabas' job in that first of Paul's great missionary voyages to translate him, to prepare the way, to convince the church with his own credibility that this guy was actually legitimate. And the gospel that he was preaching is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul needed Barnabas to act as a bridge to those early communities so that his preaching, his zeal, his passion would not scare people away, but fan the flames of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. Let that be a metaphor of the vocation of St. Barnabas Parish. 
In the ecumenical vision of Pope Benedict XVI, which informs our ordinary, the parishes of the ordinary are to function as that kind of bridge with our Protestant brothers and sisters who seek the fullness of truth and the communion of the church, but find the whole Catholic thing, well, frankly, just a little bit scary because they realize somehow, as all of those who journey into the fullness of Catholic communion at some point do, that it's an all or nothing kind of thing. You don't go into the fullness of truth. You don't profess Catholic faith with brackets around those bits you don't want to believe. Brackets around the Marian dogmas or the, the Petrine authority of the Pope or certain aspects of Catholic moral teaching and sexual teaching or something like this. No, no. It's all or nothing. And so sometimes the fullness of Catholic life as it's lived in very large and very robust parishes can seem a bit overwhelming. Very much in the same way that Paul's embrace of the fullness of the Gospel was overwhelming to those very first Christians. And so our role, our vocation, is really not, not to have a foot in both worlds. Bo uh, both worlds. Both of our feet need to be in the Catholic world. All right? But to be always looking back with an outstretched and an extended hand to show people that the fullness of Catholic communion does not mean uniformity but actually allows for a vibrant diversity of the expression of the faith we hold together. That is why we in the ordinary can worship differently. That is why we can structure ourselves differently in terms of the way that we do parish, some of the ways that we do education, certainly the way that we govern ourselves as a particular church. All of this diversity, again, in that vision of Pope Benedict XVI, does not damage the community of the Church or its communion, but amplifies it and shows it to be open and welcoming of all those things that are true, good, and beautiful. That those can be put at the service of the Church in the way that they have properly developed in the particular context from which they come. And for us, that context is the beautiful tradition of English Christianity. The role of the ordinary is to be a bridge, to show that the coming into full communion does not mean absorption and assimilation, but can be to bring a diversity of expression into the fullness of Catholic life. And there, in the Catholic Church, to find meaning and to find uh, truth expressed in a particularly beautiful way. Take the image and the example of St. Barnabas, your parish patron, as also your mission, as your vocation, to rejoice here in what it means to be Catholic, but always, always, always to be doing so in a way that is invitation that is bringing others to understand and to appreciate and to embrace what you have understood here and embraced here. We're that bridge to bring more, to make more and better Catholics. That's our job. And how we do that will be the measure of the success of St. Barnabas Parish. As we, as we establish the parish today, of course, we install its pastor. I will now talk to you by talking about Father Catania. If I ever, ever had a doubt whether or not his vocation was truly to be that of a pastor, which, of course, for the record, I do not. But if I did, they were well dispelled this morning at the rectory as we poured over plans of boilers and HVACs and budget figures and all of those wonderful things that go into the life and concerns of a pastor. He has a pastor's heart because before even any of that, he has a priestly heart. He has a heart that has been formed in the image of Christ the High Priest by the laying on of hands and the invocation of the Holy Spirit. It is the grace that God has produced in him by that sacramental act of ordination. When the Holy Spirit was poured upon him 
to conform him ever more to Christ, the head of the body of the church, so that he might stand as an effective sign of Christ's own presence in the midst of his church. And it is his duty, it is his, vo his vocation, to make sure that the life he leads always reflects the grace, the terrible grace, he has received. Because to be the authentic presence of Christ is again an all-or-nothing kind of thing. You don't stop being a priest on your day off or when your duties are done for the night. But you take that, all of what you have done in that day, and make that part and parcel of your priestly offering to God in Christ. Father Jason is a priest who has also known suffering. Great suffering sometimes in his ministry. His journey into full communion and his journey as a Catholic priest has not always been direct. And there are times when I am, uh, well, I would think, you know, that that is, is a bad thing. And I wish that some of those things did not have to happen to him. But as he and I talked in the past, in a certain other sense, I'm glad they did. Because they've made him a better priest. They've made him, made him a more authentic person. Those who have known suffering in their lives have also known how God's grace works in unlikely and unpleasant circumstances. Perhaps its working is there more apparent for the person who looks at those experiences of their life with the eyes of true faith. And so I have no doubt whatsoever that in all of his vocation, that which led him to the greatest act of his priesthood, leading his parish of Mount Calvary Episcopal Church into full communion with the Catholic Church back in Baltimore, to the daily fidelity of his priesthood, and now the daily fidelity to his responsibilities as your pastor, in all of it God's grace has been at work, forming him, forming you, and forming this community together. And for that, we can give great grace. He, as part of his priestly obligation, prays for you every day. He offers Mass for you at least once a week. And in his prayer of the Divine Office, remembers you and your needs and your petitions before Almighty God every morning and every evening. Can you say that you do the same for him? Because what person does not want a good pastor and a good priest? Well, these, these things don't just happen. They're formed in the prayer of the communion. The more that you pray for him, the greater God's grace will penetrate the greater his heart will be conformed to that of Christ the High Priest, and the better priest he becomes. He needs your prayers, even as you need his and his sacramental ministry among you. Never forget that wonderful relationship between the pastor and the people entrusted to his pastoral care. As much as he will give his life for you, so you, dear people, give your lives for him in prayer, so that God's grace will continue through the sacraments he brings you, through the forgiveness of your sins and confession, through the body and blood of the Lord that you receive at Holy Communion, through that healing hand of the anointing of the sick that he brings through his priestly ministry, that Christ will truly be present in your midst here at St. Barnabas in Omaha for the salvation of the world. Now let's get down to business. Before we install Father as pastor of St. Barnabas, we have to have the canonical thing to which he is installed. The decree of erection, act, uh, canonically establishing this as a parish, I have already signed and sealed, but the canonical act takes place now. As I read to you the decree, and then Father and I will move to the altar and continue the act of installation of the pastor. A decree of erection of St. Barnabas Parish in Omaha, Nebraska. I, the undersigned Most Reverend Stephen Joseph Lopes, Bishop of the Personal Ordinary of the Chair of St. Peter, in accordance with Canon 515, number 2, as well as Canons 50, 51, 120, 121, 127, and 166, 
whereas having lawfully convoked the members of the Governing Council on April the 26, 2018, in order to present them with all relevant information regarding the proposed erection of St. Barnabas Parish, and having heard their consultation and received their unanimous consent in conformity with to what is established in the consulentary norms to the Apostolic Constitution Anglican Norm Chaitibus number 12, that the quasi-parish of St. Barnabas be now created as a parish. Whereas the governing council of the ordinary unanimously concurred with the opinion of the Reverend Jason Catania, parochial administrator of St. Barnabas, regarding the, the successful achievement of the goals for parish status as enumerated in the document Architects of Communion. Whereas, in accordance with Canon 50, all those whose rights could be injured were heard and consulted by such means as the parish council and the corporate officers of the quasi-parish. Therefore, it is determined that the church building and physical plant at St. Barnabas Church in Omaha, Nebraska, are adequate to accommodate the parishioners of this ordinary community and provide for their future growth and the development of this parochial community. In light of these considerations and consultations, and for the pastoral good of souls, I herewith decree that the community of St. Barnabas is established as a parish of the personal ordinariate of the chair of St. Peter, with all assets, liabilities, and obligations of the former quasi-parish transferring to the new parish, in accord with the law of the church. Given at Houston at the Chancery in Texas, on the 10th day of June in the year of our Lord, 2018.